So we're going to talk this morning about a mission from the Philadelphia churches to Jewish immigrants. And a little context for this. In 1871, the Reformed Presbyterian Church uh, wrote and signed its covenant. And in the preamble, it criticized this country because the history of the government has been largely one of oppression and injustice towards its aboriginal and colored people and of iniquitous distinction of caste. And uh, right after the Civil War, the RP Church at a national level um, aimed to start a mission to freedmen, as they were called, in the South. They looked at about four or five locations and settled on Selma, Alabama, where we still have a <laughs> congregation. And then the uh, Synod looked to set up a mission to Indians in Oklahoma. And in southwest Oklahoma, there was a mission to three tribes, the three tribes most resistant to being put on a reservation, the Comanches, the Apaches, and the Kiowas. And that is a rather astonishing story. Then there were other home missions that were done um, not on the Synod level, but on the presbytery or the congregational level. So there was a uh, mission in Cincinnati to Jewish immigrants that was basically the, a congregational thing, and that was because um, a Jewish doctor from Germany, highly educated, arrives in this country, and in order to learn English, decides to go to the nearest English-speaking church, which was the uh, Covenanter Church in Cincinnati. And here he ran into familiar psalms, um, a rather Hebraic form of Christianity. Um, if you go through the whole span of Christianity, the um, Reformed churches are the most Hebraic, shall we say, um, most uh, involved with the Old Testament. And at the end of the year, he was baptized. Went to the RP Seminary. His name is Lewis Meyer. And um, through his influence... Actually, the pastor started the general mission there in Cincinnati to the Jews. Now, Lewis Meyer becomes the best-known RP minister of the 20th century. Not in our circles. We have totally forgotten about him. Um, but if you Google his name with Biola University, you will find a great deal of information about Lewis Meyer um, there. Uh, the guy was a brilliant, brilliant man who becomes one of the two editors of a long set of publications known as The Fundamentals. Um, and then we come to Philadelphia, which was not congregational and not synod, but a presbytery mission. A little background on Jewish immigration. There were three great waves of Jewish immigration in this country. 1848, which is Jewish immigration essentially from Germany and Central Europe after failed revolutions there, and a lot of them were running for their lives. It's a number 10 to 20,000, highly educated, and um, come to this country. A second similar group of Jewish immigrants uh, arrive in 1933. <laughs> 34 and 35, also from Germany, also fleeing for their lives. But the middle group of immigrants who were Jewish is much, much larger, and it's from the uh, Russian Empire. And they begin coming here about 1880, escaping uh, Russian pogroms in which uh, Russian troops would simply um, um, ride into a Jewish village and start slaughtering people and the numbers are actually rather astonishing. They have been dwarfed by the later numbers of uh, Stalin and Hitler, but they were impressive numbers. And so about 2 million Jews between 1880 and 1914 arrive in this country, settle in the big cities, New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, Baltimore. And... Um, so in Philadelphia, there were about 100,000 new immigrants by 1900, mostly centered in the middle of the city, and not highly educated, not highly skilled. Um, they don't know English. And uh, in 1900, 
there is no government food stamp program. There is no Medicaid program. There is no nothing from the government. Basically, you arrive and you try to figure out how to survive. Now, the story of the Jewish mission from Philadelphia begins in Odessa. Odessa is a uh, city in the Crimea, and um, many Jews had settled there for commercial reasons, and a Jewish family in Odessa sent their 18-year-old son to Constantinople to represent the uh, family business as a cloth merchant. Two years later, at age 20, the family sent him to uh, a Turkish port named Mersin, which is just north of Cyprus. And there he ran into the um, Covenanter missionary David Matheny. <laughs> David Matheny deserves his own biography. He is the um, most interesting of all of the 19th century uh, RP missionaries from this country. Um, so he runs into David Matheny in Mersin, and he's converted. David Matheny has money. Uh, not only was David Matheny a doctor, um, he was also the only ordained preacher not to go to seminary in the church in the 19th century. century. And apparently he knew every building trade there was. Um, at one point, as he was overseeing buildings, somebody said, how much money did you pay to learn all these different trades? And of course, having grown up as an American in the 19th century, he just had picked up all these trades. Um, so he runs into David Matheny, he's converted, and David then sends him to Philadelphia. <laughs> Joins the Philadelphia congregation. There were three at that point. First Philadelphia, these are, these are not hard to name. First Philadelphia, second Philadelphia, third Philadelphia. And um, um, sponsors him to attend Geneva College. Sponsors him to go to the RP Seminary. And his name is Moses Greenberg. After watching Moses for about four or five years, um, the presbytery here and David concluded he will be a good missionary. So David Matheny buys him a house in Philadelphia in the uh, what we would call Center City today. And while he was going to uh, seminary, which in those days only was six months of the year, so you had six months on and six months off. It was a four-year term. Um, now it's eight months on, three years term, ten number of months, but uh, uh, that was the seminary schedule. Um, he would go around with the uh, pastor of Second Church, um, Samuel Wiley. And they would knock on doors and start doing missionary work. After his first year of seminary, he spent two years in Leipzig, Germany, where he got more education and found a wife whom he brought back to this country. Finally, in 1897, he was licensed to preach. But even before then, they had their first person who was baptized, Nathan Feinberg, 1895. And the consequence was he immediately lost his job. So it was not so easy just automatically to become a Christian if you were in a large Jewish community in Philadelphia. Um, Moses Greenberg and his wife, um, with the cooperation of all three Philadelphia churches, a lot of the young people and the pastors involved, um, set up a busy schedule of what we would today call basically social work as well as preaching. So there was a doctor, Dr. Alexander Caldwell, who offered free medical service every Tuesday and Saturday all year after year after year after year um, in, the, in uh, one of the rooms in the house there in Philadelphia. They had an evening Sabbath service. Um, they, uh, Mrs. Greenberg taught sewing to um, provide uh, skills for um, uh, people who were coming over here. And of course, they had English classes. Uh, <clears throat> by 1900, the number of people wanting English classes was so large that they simply had to turn people away as they offered English classes. So they offered 
vocational training, English classes, medical training, and at every opportunity, um, the gospel. This did not go over fully well in the immigrant Jewish community. By 1901, there were street fights outside the house. This got um, a lot of notice in the Philadelphia papers. Um, Moses Greenberg went to the police. The police helped. Uh, several men were arrested. Uh, the fights died down. However, the um, RP missionary paper at the time, entitled Olive Trees, published by uh, Somerville, who was the pastor in the New York congregation, um, he was the corresponding secretary of the Foreign Mission Board, um, wrote a snarty, snarky article um, criticizing Greenberg for having gone to the police for help. He said, Jesus and Paul never did any such thing. Now, where Paul is concerned, that's a little bit strange. And for the corresponding secretary of the Foreign Mission Board, whose missionaries uh, more than once were rescued by American and British warships, that's just their own uh, interesting stories over there in Syria, um, uh, this seemed a little out of line. So the consequence was that um, Samuel Wiley started publishing his own paper entitled The Hebrew Messenger. It was a quarterly and came out of Philadelphia. Um, and most of the rest of what I have simply comes right out of the Hebrew Messenger. Um, the articles written by uh, Greenberg, uh, by his wife, by people in the Philadelphia churches, and so they were going to tell their own story. So I pick up now with information from the uh, Hebrew Messenger. By 1900, Neighborhoods had shifted in Philadelphia. What the paper said was people of lower quality were moving into the Jewish neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Italians. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't say Italians, but that's who it was. So the, <laughs> so, so the, uh, the, the, uh, the Jewish community had, had shifted. So they sold the house on Lombard Street and bought a new house in the very center of the Jewish settlement at 800 South 5th Street, still in what we would call Center City. In the first issue of the Hebrew Messenger, Greenberg described the house and included this account of the reading room. Um, you know the Christian science, uh, have you seen them? They all have reading rooms. Well, that actually used to be a lot more common in churches um, and, and wasn't a peculiarly just Christian science thing. So the, uh, the house there had a reading room. He writes, the front window is filled with open Bibles. In Hebrew, Jewish, i.e. Yiddish, German, English, Russian, Romanian, Polish, and Hungarian. Around this window, crowds of Hebrews often congregate and debate on the life and character and work of Jesus and are at times audible at a distance. <laughs> For six weeks after it opened in June 1901, there were large crowds at services and classes. He writes, then came a sudden and painful reaction. The mob began to collect at the door at each meeting, making it well nigh impossible for any to pass in or out. Police finally arrested the leader who had been citing, inciting the mob to violence, but disruptions continued. We cannot say that we have the sympathy of the city officials. Now, although Philadelphia Presbytery oversaw the mission, congregations across the country supported it with money, food, and clothing. And every issue of the Hebrew Messenger named every congregation that had sent money, food, and clothing. So the third issue, for example, thanks Covenanters in Newburgh, New York, Slippery Rock, Pennsylvania, um, congregations in Iowa, and of course in Philadelphia. In October 1902, Philadelphia Presbytery ordained Moses Greenberg to the gospel ministry. But the April 1903 edition reported trouble. Mrs. Greenberg is at present visiting her parents in Germany, taking a much needed rest. Her health has failed her during the past year. The constant strain of the work 
and especially in the new locality where for a time hostility was bitter, has been too great for her to endure. Replacing her after nine years' experience was difficult, but the local churches certainly tried. Two children of Dr. David Matheny, Miss Evangeline Matheny and Dr. S.A.S. Matheny, helped for a time. Uh, Evangeline and S.A.S. Matheny eventually go back to Turkey. They've got their own interesting stories attached to them also. But we move on. While Mrs. Greenberg was gone, a very wealthy Jew in the city visited him with an offer to buy the mission house at far above market value. He got turned down. Evangela Matheny in the Hebrew Messenger explained the special challenge for Christians working with newly arrived Jews fleeing persecutions in Europe and the persecutions were coming in the Russian Empire, which was officially Christian. She writes, we have in Turkey a kind of large black lizard, so like a snake that only a close examination shows the difference. A man who meets one of the reptiles usually gets out of the way as fast as he can without making any minute scrutiny. Now, herein is a parable. The Christian sects of Europe are the snake. We are the lizard. And the Jew is not going to spend his time looking for the differences between us. Having suffered every indignity and barbarity at the hands of some Christian sects, he prefers to have nothing to do with any Christian whatever. Small blame to the Jew. For years, our missionaries have been trying by every means in their power to make the persecuted people understand that there are Christians and Christians. But the process is slow. Every week brings new refugees to America from their homes in Europe with new experiences of bitter degradation and exile. The only thing for us to do is to keep steadily on, doing them kindnesses whenever we can, and proving that we are their friends. In the fall of 1903, Mrs. Greenberg returned with improved health. There were good audiences, Sabbath evenings, and excellent attention. Sabbath afternoon, Sabbath school for children, English evening classes three nights a week, sewing classes, and the active dispensary. And then suddenly, Greenberg resigned, saying only that his reasons were private and personal. After Philadelphia Presbytery twice tried to get him to reconsider, it sadly accepted his resignation. What happened? Well, the same issue of the Hebrew messenger that reports his resignation also reports that Mrs. Greenberg is again in Germany with her mother. One guesses that Mrs. Greenberg from Germany had had enough of the stressful life as a Christian missionary in the mostly Eastern European Jewish ghetto in Philadelphia. Not the first or the last missionary wife to reach that conclusion. And Mr. Greenberg had heard the question, how many converts have you had too often? The Reverend George M. Robb, age 44, came from Syracuse to take Greenberg's place almost immediately, but he could not preach in Yiddish. He needed a translator, and he found one almost immediately with the name of Ezra J. Foyer Zone. If that name sounds Jewish to you, that's because he's Jewish. He was one of the 100,000 Jews now in Philadelphia, nearly all from Russia, and he arrived already converted. Christ had met Greenberg in Turkey, foyer zone in Russia. And here is his story of his conversion as published in the Hebrew Messenger. He writes, I was born in Russia. My father was an Orthodox Jew and a Russian citizen. He had a position in the Russian government, but was very strict in the Jewish faith. Later on, my brother and I attended a rabbinical school, and while attending this school, a Hebrew Christian missionary came to the city. 
he distributed tracts and New Testaments and told all with whom he came in contact of the Messiah. After I saw the missionary, my heart became troubled, and I could not refrain from asking myself if there was any way that I could see him personally and ask him if Jesus was the true Messiah and the real Son of God. Then other questions arose. Nevertheless, I was determined to see him, and early the next morning he passed the school, and I overtook him in a narrow street where people could not see me talking to him. I asked him many questions. I can only remember two, and they were, Is Jesus able to save a person from sin? This shows what a great sinner I was. And, How could a person be saved if he was a blasphemer of Jesus? He gave me a New Testament and told me to read 1 Timothy 1, verse 13, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. These words sank deep into my heart, and I came to the conclusion that there was hope for me and my sins could be forgiven. For nine long years, I carried the Bible in my trunk, traveling from one country to another. I spent those nine years in darkness, sin, and shame, just as many of my Jewish brethren are doing today. But all through these nine years, I had a hungering in my heart for something better, and the word of God came to me over and over again, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And then the question came, what must I do to be saved? And the answer came to me, believe on the Lord Jesus and thou shalt be saved. At that time, I was in Romania. And as my profession was teaching, I spent about three years teaching school, especially among the Jews. Those three years I spent with the Lord in secret. The Lord led me to a Hebrew Christian missionary where I spent many days in prayer and studying the New Testament. After a short time, I was baptized by the London Episcopal Society in Bucharest, Romania. When the Jewish people learned this, they began to persecute me, and I suffered much. Many days, I had no bread. I lost my position and was cut off from my race and friends. After several years of suffering and persecution, I left Romania and went to Russia. While at home, I received the severest persecution of my life. I found my mother entirely blind, but she was able to recognize my voice. The first question she asked me was, how could I believe that Christ was the true Messiah and the Son of God? I distributed tracts in New Testaments, preached the Word of God, and magnified the name of our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. While doing this, two special policemen came with a warrant to arrest me, because some of the Jewish people said that I had secret papers and books and might be one of those who wished to destroy the Tsar's life. I was in prison about four months, with my hands and feet in chains, not knowing why I was put there. I was persecuted by the rough prisoners around me, but these words came to me. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. The last night of the four months, I dreamed that some person stood by my side and took off the chains from my hands and feet and told me to arise and shine and leave the Russian country, for the light had come. When I awoke, the overseer came and called out the prisoners into the yard to see if their chains were in good order. While we were standing there, a telegram came from St. Petersburg, which read thus, E.J. Foyerson is free from prison but has no right to distribute tracts or testaments without the authority of the Russian government. Then the master of the prison ordered an officer to take off my chains. When I reached the hotel, I received a letter from my brother-in-law and sisters in America, and in that letter was enclosed a ticket with necessary traveling expenses to America. From that moment, I took courage and was strong in the Lord because all the things that I had seen in the dream had come to pass. I left Russia in 1902 and came to this country ignorant of the English language. My brother-in-law and sisters received me kindly, but tried to induce me to accept a position on these conditions. 
that I was not to follow Christ and be entirely free from Christianity. I told them I could not live without Christ, and they then believed me insane, and later, later on brought in a doctor to examine me. Not being able to understand the English language, I knew nothing of what they were doing. The doctor telephoned for a carriage, and some strong men carried me to a private insane asylum. My brother-in-law agreed to pay for me, but as he could not keep the agreement, I was only there a few days. For a time, I remained preaching and witnessing for Christ to my people in a Jewish Bible house in Philadelphia. But I had a great desire for more knowledge of the Word of God, so I was led to resign my position and take a full course of biblical study in the Christian Alliance Institute at Nyack, New York, from which I graduated May 1, 1905. At once, I thought you'd like the Nyack uh, reference there. At once, God opened the door for me to enter this Jewish mission, which this messenger represents, the covenant mission to Israel. By the way, the name was devised by David Matheny. In 1907, Rob resigned his work done, and Presbytery ordained Feuerstone in 1909. But you didn't know we had so many ordained Jewish preachers in the early 20th century. Many Jews were reading the New Testament, attending services, inviting foyer's own into their homes, but Jews were also afraid to defy their families by openly professing Christ. A letter to the Hebrew messenger by Philadelphia elder William Carson mentioned the many times he saw foyer's own meeting with a visitor, Bible open, addressing the question, was Jesus truly the prophesied Messiah? In May 1913, Feuerstone resigned because of ill health, and the mission closed for six months. When the Reverend Robert Blair, together with Miss Annie Forsyth from Third RP Church, that's the ancestor of Elkin Spark, uh, replaced him, intense antagonism met them, with a mass meeting protesting all missionary efforts among the Jews. A converted Hebrew, Mr. Muller, began preaching in Yiddish, with members from all three Philadelphia RP churches helping, especially with the singing. The mission again maintained a full schedule as it had in the days of Greenberg and Feuerstone, preaching in Yiddish Friday and Saturday nights, two English classes four days a week, sewing classes, noonday preaching four days a week, a boys' mercy band. I have no idea why the boys' bands were had the word mercy thrown in, but anyway, a boys' mercy band, outdoor preaching in summer, an afternoon Sabbath school, youth group meetings, summer daily vacation Bible school, the medical dispensary, and special celebrations at Passover, Thanksgiving, and Christmas. The 1915 report to Synod concluded, the most important item, seven souls were brought into the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, three Italians in one family, and four Jews, fathers of families, professed their faith in Christ and asked for baptism. They were publicly baptized in the mission building and the same day sat down with the missionaries and other friends at the Lord's table in the first communion ever dispensed in the mission of the covenant to Israel. By 1916, Mr. Muller had left the mission, but Mr. Blair continued to preach at noon five days a week in an open park near the mission usually to crowds as large as could hear him. One young girl who attended the mission came down with a fatal illness. As she lay dying, a missionary, uh, Miss Forsyth, probably visited her. She writes, in her presence, she repeated word for word the 23rd Psalm, and when asked about her Savior, she said, yes, I love Jesus. And the missionary said, this one incident would have repaid me for all I have done. The next year, Mr. Blair resigned, citing his inability to preach in Yiddish. The mission hired Miss Emma McFarland to, jo to join Miss Forsyth, and their attention turned almost entirely to reaching women and children. The three Philadelphia RP pastors in turn preached on Sabbath evenings. World War I had cut off immigration, and the post-war Johnson Reed Act stopped it from reviving. So English language instruction was soon unneeded. 
Uh, the mission continued, but this chapter ends with 1920, so that's where my account of the Jewish mission in Philadelphia ends at this point in 1920. There's a lot I left out, which, of course, you discover, but you can't include. Do you have questions you'd like to ask? Betsy. Um, on in the, any indication that there is a Yiddish equivalent of our Psalter? No. I do know that the RP missionaries everywhere really aim to um, translate into Chinese, Arabic, and Turkish, and even into Comanche. <laughs> um, but I think the idea here was everybody's madly learning English, and we're going to be in English soon. So I don't think there was the same effort um, to do the translation into Yiddish here. Did you come across any stories of upper-level Jewish, uh, I don't know what the <coughs> words they use for this, like rabbis, teachers, people that would then influence uh, their whole community? Um, probably they're behind and encouraging uh, some of the mob action and... Um, uh, the street fighting, they, they wouldn't be out there leading it themselves. And I can only say probably, I don't know. Mm. There, there are no accusations aimed that way in the uh, materials that I read. Mm. But in terms of any conversions among that class of no. people? No. Right. no. Mm. Other questions? Okay. Thank you all. Oh, Betsy? Uh, is it reported if Greenberg and Mrs. Uh, remained within the church? Um, they headed off to California. Okay. And it's not specified what her illness was. Um, so there were certain illnesses for which the uh, prescription back in those days was go to California and uh, uh, get out of the cold weather and get into dry climates. Um, at that point in California, California is so big and um, RP churches are just getting organized. Um, at the, their trail is just lost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One thing that uh, I didn't mention here, the uh, uh, Hebrew messenger has a photo of both of them. Um, he is about as handsome a man as you'd see, and she is beautiful. <laughs> um, And she from Germany, of course, is from a very, uh, there's a huge gulf between the Eastern European Jews and the German Jews. Um, so uh, she's, from a, she's from a totally different cultural world, um, aside from the Jewishness, than the people in Philadelphia that she's uh, ministering to. And her husband would be somewhere in between with his education in this country. So we've heard of persecution from the Jewish people on the RP mission. Right. What about backlash from just general anti-Semitism towards them trying to convert <coughs> Jews? I, I ran into nothing of that whatsoever. What I did run into was simply an account of how little effort was being made along these lines. So you've got a sudden immigrant population of 100,000, and there were two or three Christian missions in Philadelphia aimed at the Jews. We were one of them. Mm -hmm. I would note also that um, in reading old documents, you have to uh, be careful not to read current nomenclature back in. So today, our home mission board is all aimed at planting new RP churches in the most agreeable places possible. Um, the home mission board back then was aimed at um, populations which were as... Um, not mainstream, you might say, as possible. So freedmen, Comanches. Um, I didn't mention the Chinese immigrants in Oakland. Uh, that was another personal mission that uh, is begun by a guy named Johnston. And uh, uh, he moves there in the 1870s to begin mission work among the Chinese. And his vision was convert the Chinese here and send them back to China as missionaries. That did not happen. But for a while, there is a mixed Chinese and um, Anglo, you might say, church in Oakland. Um, in 1882, 
the U.S. government passes its first immigration control law, which is the uh, a law to forbid specifically Chinese immigration. And the RP Synod um, sends to Congress its protest that uh, people have a God-given right to live where they choose to. <laughs> so it was a complete open borders argument. Um, and Johnson, of course, was behind it at this point. Mm -hmm. So, and that mission lasts till about 1900, but it really never mounts to more than his personal mission, although some others go there for a short time. Um, but he, along with Matheny, um, badger the synod for about 20 years to start a mission in China. <laughs> and uh, they finally vote to do so in 1892 and send their first missionaries in 1895. And of all our missions, it's, I think, by far the most interesting. Um, but again, that's not this morning's talk. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, I forgot. I wanted to ask this question at the beginning. You mentioned in the 1840s, the Jews were fleeing persecution or they were fleeing the situation in Europe because of failed revolutions. Were those Marxist revolutions? No, that's pre-Marx. Yeah. It's pre-Marx. Um, <laughs> yeah, in 1848, there are a number of revolutions that overthrow monarchies throughout Europe. Um, they're not successful, so within six to eight months, um, uh, the monarchs successfully reestablished themselves. And if you were involved, um, you wanted to flee, and the best place to flee was this country. So it was just a general populist? No, this is sort of an echo from the French Revolution, right? And you have, you have two echoes like that, 1830 and 1848 in Europe. Uh, 1848 is the larger one where you have some success. And actually, Marx writes for the first time as a journalist about the, eight, the 1848 revolutions and begins to uh, have the analysis that becomes more familiar as to what's going on. Um, yeah, my own opinion is that both the 1848 and the 1933 immigrants have a, give a great push towards the secularization of this country because in both cases, the people coming are more sophisticated and better educated than Americans are, and they end up grabbing the uh, central places at Harvard, Princeton, Yale, and so on because academically, they deserve them. Um, the most notable example, of course, would be Einstein who comes and uh, becomes a Princeton um, uh, professor, but there are, there are thousands like that. And um, so I think both of those have a, probably, although a number is much smaller than the Eastern European, um, have, a, have a bigger impact on the trajectory of American life and culture um, within a generation after their arrival. Mm -hmm. Oh, they're not orthodox. They're not orthodox. No, no. Since within, it, within right. Judaism, they're already more secular uh, than in the face of Christian America. They want to be more secular. Yeah. Cincinnati um, in the 19th century is the headquarters of Reform Judaism. So although Louis Meyer is actually raised orthodox, he's there in a Reformed Jewish environment. Um, and the Reform Jewish is to Orthodox Jew as mainline liberal Protestant is to fundamentalist Protestant. Um, so. All right, thank you all.